Thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, this conversation that we're facilitating and holding as Who's Knowledge is a conversation around the internet shutdown in Tigray and the internet governance forum that is happening this week, um, November 2022 in Ethiopia, which has been a um, genocidal uh, oppressor of people in Tigray and uh, the perpetrator of a two year long internet shutdown in Ethiopia and particularly in the Tigray region. I will introduce our extraordinary activists from Tigray in just a minute. But uh, to introduce myself, I'm Anasuya Sengupta and I'm part of a feminist collective called Whose Knowledge, which is a um, global lingual campaign to center the leadership, the design, the histories, the knowledges, and the imaginations of all who have been marginalized historically and in ongoing ways through structures of power and privilege. Our primary way of thinking about the internet is to think about how to decolonize it. And so many of our, much of our work has been around holding Western governments and Western corporations and Western institutions of different kinds, including civil society, to account of speaking truth to power of recognizing the deep structures of colonial capitalism. But at the same time, we have to hold our own governments, our own corporations, our own friends, including those in civil society, to account. We have to speak truth to the power that we are part of. Our governments use the synchronizing technologies on our own people within our own regions. And that is why we're having this conversation today whose knowledge we thought long and hard about whether we should be part in that governance forum that is happening in Ethiopia right now. And we decided we could not. We needed to boycott it as an act of solidarity, as an act of being witness, as an act of holding in testimony what is happening in Tigray right and over the past two years. For the Internet Governance Forum to be held country that has held one of the longest internet shutdowns at a time when in the Tigray region, a place of 7 million people, nearly half a million people have been killed over this period of the shutdown through the actions, through the genocidal actions of this government is not just irony, it's not just Cognitive dissonance, act of complicity in genocide. And so we stand in solidarity with our friends in Tigray, in Ethiopia, and across the diaspora who have been trying to hold their government to account, who have been trying to hold the international civil society to account, who have been trying to hold all the multi stakeholders in the internet governance space to account. We believe at whose knowledge that it should always be those who are affected, who are sent in any conversation that concerns them. And so to exception, this conversation is to center three extraordinary activists from Tigray who are fighting for justice, for truth, and for um, the liberation of their peoples in Tigray and beyond. I would like to um, introduce Salam G, Melatu, and Mulubbe. Salam and Melat are Tigray Youth Network Advocacy members, and Mulu is a lawyer from Tigray who is currently pursuing a PhD in Norway. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague and compañera, Mariana Fusati who will uh, begin the conversation with the activists from Tigray to tell us what is happening in Tigray and why is it so important to us, including our friends who are at IGF right now, know about what's going on. Over to you, Mariana. 
Thank you, Anna Suya, for the opening. And thank you, Melat, Mulu, and Salam for, for being here with us and uh, for being willing to uh, talk with us about these topics and so important questions. Uh, I will um, uh, start with, uh, we have initially four questions. I will pass uh, the word uh, through you, um, fair, uh, starting for the first one, and then the other one, and then the other one. And at the end, if you have uh, any other uh, topic or question you want to address, or if you want to comment to each other, uh, feel free to do that also. Uh, so first question uh, for everybody to understand clearly what is happening in Tigray, what is happening in the last few years, but before and, and what's the, 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 content, the context in which this is happening. And maybe we can start uh, with Melat. Do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you guys for having this discussion. I think it's really important. Um, and I think just to start off by um, maybe if we go back, um, I think the context in Ethiopia is a bit complicated for us to tackle in, in such a short period of time. Um, and it has a lot of historical context. Uh, there is a lot of historical grievances between different ethnic groups um, and there's a political um, dynamic that's very hard to explain, I think, but I would kind of simplify it by saying it's uh, complex and um, it includes various different ethnic groups, not just Tigrayans. Um, so with that in mind, um, in November the 4th of 2020, which is um, two years ago, there was a conflict that erupted between the government of Ethiopia um, and the government of Tigray, the regional government of Tigray. Um, that, um, obviously, as we see now, has led to a, a very dire situation um, in terms of humanitarian um, aspects. There is a dire need for humanitarian assistance, which um, is um, effectively being blockaded uh, systematically by the state, by the federal government of Ethiopia, um, and they're using that uh, that siege, a siege of the region of Tigray to control um, the way that the conflict unfolds. Um, so th they are co using starvation as a weapon of war. Uh, sexual gender-based violence has been rampant. Um, I mean, very underreported as well, but um, even with the numbers that has been reported, it is um, rampant and has um, a system, a systematic kind of nature, a deliberate and and, and, uh, and um, a notion of intent that goes alongside it. Um, and again, this is what led us to say very early on that this was indeed a genocide, um, not just a conflict, but it was an effort to um, subjugate, oppress and inflict very painful and horrendous atrocities on the civilians not just um, the the <clears throat> not just on a military capacity. So, um, what's going on in Tigray right now is that we have refugees who have um, uh, managed to escape to uh, Sudan, who currently live in camps there, uh, makeshift camps which are very under um, under resourced and um, do not get uh, enough budgeting. Um, there is various issues again like our issues do not end with one thing um, so the refugees are very um, that we've got over 73,000 refugees in Sudan um, we also have um, uh, arbitrary arrests all over Ethiopia of ethnic Tigrayans some that served in administrative within the administration roles within the government some just normal civilians who have just been apprehended um, all over Ethiopia uh, so there was a lot of mass arrests um, all over the country, not just in Addis Ababa, but all over the country. Um, and we also have, as you know, over 6 million people in the region of Tigray, um, which have been classified under phase four and five of the IPC um, classification as being in a very dire situation. 
um, famine cannot be declared because, as we know, famine has in the last in the last um, couple of decades actually been very uh, politicized. And obviously, access. Um, I know that is the main topic of our discussion, but access to actually gain declarations to some of these um, to some of these declarations that are needed to take immediate action. You know. Um, uh, are lacking because of the lack of access and the lack of information and the lack of um, just like investigations required by the UN bodies and um, impartial investigation bodies. Um, so there is a massive, um, obviously when I say a siege, that not only includes the humanitarian aspect of it, but also on um, a communication kind of element, there is absolutely no communication from the region. Um, people are not able to communicate with loved ones. We are unable to get uh, frequent updates about um, anything, all the atrocities that had been taking place. So a lot of the information we were getting, it was very, very slow, um, such as things that happened in Aksum, the Aksum massacre, for example, which is exactly a few years now, um, where hundreds were massacred by Eritrean forces, uh, which I forgot to mention, actually, which is a very big element of the war, is that the war has actually been, um, it's actually an international conflict, um, which has not been declared as such, but the role of Eritrea, which is a foreign country being involved in Ethiopia, has um, would arguably uh, be categorized as an international conflict. Um, the Eritrean troops have, you know, committed endless atrocities, human rights organizations have reported on this, but um, again, um, th this is very underreported, um, uninvestigated. There's a lot of gaps in the information because um, essentially what the state is trying to do, what the federal government is trying to do, is cut off that communication so, um, so that there is a lack of evidence, there's a lack of empirical evidence for um, people such as myself, Mulu and Salam, to actually use um, to, to further um, what we have been saying from the start, which is that there is an intent um, coming from the federal government and the Eritrean regime um, to destroy the Tigrayan identity, to actually target Tigrayans as an ethnic group rather than just a political conflict, uh, a conflict that arose from just a political disagreement. Um, and it's just heavily, I mean, it's just concentrated upon. Um, uh, the political aspect. Um, so um, again, like um, this is a very vague kind of um, introduction to what is going on in Tigray, but um, I think just to point out the, the dire need right now after two years of receiving no aid, no medical supplies, the destruction of infrastructure, whether that's medical, educational, any type of infrastructure that the civilians and the population of Tigray could benefit from, and the deliberate destruction of that um, is what uh, is very, very um, uh, urgent right now because people, you know, the people have died from starvation. People have died from a lack of medical resources, from medications such as insulin. It's a very simple medication, um, which is very accessible outside of Togo, but, you know, they're really suffering from these things that are very preventable. And that is because um, there is a there is a, a a want and a need coming from the state to actually subjugate these people and oppress them, um, so that um, they can have an upper hand militarily and politically. Um, so that is that is I think my um, perspective on a brief perspective on what's going on in Tigray right now. Maybe if Salam and Mulu can add to that, that'd be great. Thank you, Melat. And and yes, maybe we can continue with with Mulu, maybe. Thank you uh, again. Well, my name is Mulu, Mulu Bayena. Um, I am a lawyer by training and I'm, I'm doing further studies in, in Europe in Norway. Um, well, as a very curious question, what is happening in Tigray? Um, I would say that we do not really know what, what's happening in Tigray would be my uh, first line of um, answer. From the little we know, um, from um, some reports, few local media and certain humanitarian organizations, however, 
we can say a few things uh, on top of what Milat has said. Um, so today, Integrai, one-fourth, approximately one-fourth of the population of Tigray are forcefully displaced from, from their homes, from their places. So a very impoverished population is hosting uh, over a million, some four, four million and some are hosting over a million dependents, basically. Uh, many have fled uh, the country to Sudan, as, as mentioned. We understand that we have lost around 10% of the population over the last two years. Whereas we do not really know who of our relatives exist, who has died and how. Um, so the days mortality is increasing. So the cost would continue uh, obviously for many years to come. And this has not to do only with uh, the, the, the combatants. Uh, these people did not die only through the, the active shooting, but mainly of uh, starvation, which has been the main means of war uh, uh, by Ethiopia, Eritrea and its allies. It's very systematic. The way the war has been conducted is very systematic. Uh, initially, means of production was destroyed. Uh, to just mention the first report from the UN coordination humanitarian offices shows that in Tigray, we have had 269 ambulances before the war, serving 6 million people. This being a poor, a poor country, anyhow. After the war, there were only 35 ambulances to be found. The rest are either burned or taken, looted to other regions and to Eritrea. Industries that have been supporting hundreds of thousands, probably, are either looted or destroyed intentionally. Something that's akin to a, a, a middle-aged kind of war. You go, you conquer, and you do whatever you do with impunity. We have a region that has gone through this for two, for two years. Over 90% of the population has is now dependent, fully dependent on aid, and aid has been intentionally blockaded. It has been a month since a peace treaty, which in effect was a, a surrender uh, induced by this long starvation as a means of war. Even after that peace, humanitarian aid, restoration of the basic services has not been prioritized. So still today, a month into the peace talk, the peace agreement, or we would say the, the so-called peace agreement, um, means of life, uh, livelihood in, in, in Tigray, the basic means of livelihood has not been restored. Telecommunications, which is uh, communications, which is the, the focus of this talk, um, have been have been used a part of this this uh, genocidal war. So it should be seen in light of the other measures that the regime and its, its partners have used in, in the last uh, two years uh, and more. In, in 2000, uh, this, I, I would like to put this in, in, in a context through three related stories, very briefly. In 2018, we had a change of government and the optimism was very high. We're hoping some changes would come. Uh, and then I participated in a internet conference in Addis Ababa in 2019 with this new government. And a minister came and said that Ethiopia will never shut the internet from this time on. 
And then it was only within months that some kind of violence took place in South Ethiopia and internet was shut down. So it, it's not the first time, of course, it's of different nature, but internet shutdown has taken place before 2018, but now it's of a different nature. And then the night the war broke out, I was discussing, chatting actually with a colleague of mine in Mali University in, regarding a paper he was writing. And then it was stopped. I have never heard or called, uh, received any message from him in, in over two years now. So it was the very minute the conflict started, common, all communications were off for 41 days. And then Ethiopian forces took over Tigray and internet communication was restored intermittently. And then Tigrayan forces took Magala, the capital of Tigray, on June, 2000, uh, June 28, 2021. The next day, internet and all communications were shut, simply indicating that it was intentional. It has nothing to do with the physical destruction of the means of communications. And today, if there was a possible, <laughs> the will, obviously, internet, other communications, the banking, uh, electricity could have been turned on in a, in a flicker of uh, time. I think that would do for now. Uh, that's where we, what I understand about Tigray from the, the little information that I have. Otherwise, I, I do not really have a, a first-hand information from people uh, on the ground because I did not, I do not really have uh, email communications apart from minutes of audio files that I receive from time to time in, in the intervals of two, three months from friends who would briefly say that we are copying, we are alive. Otherwise, I do not know about my family, friends, colleagues, and, and, and any, anything about the region. Uh, yes, that would do from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mulu. And let's, let's continue with Selam. All right, thank you. Uh, I think they have covered most of it. Uh, just to give more context, uh, just to talk about Tigray before the war. Uh, Tigray is um, basically one of the nine um, regional states in Ethiopia. So uh, it is an, an ancient state. Uh, it has a rich culture and tradition and history. So. Um, Prior to the war, uh, Tigray was one of the most peaceful regions, even uh, when uh, there were uh, violence in other parts of the country. Tigray was one of the most peaceful, uh, probably the only peaceful uh, regions in, uh, in Ethiopia. So uh, it was also one of the fast growing regions uh, with uh, it was a great destination for new businesses, for foreign uh, investments. Um, with a very civilized community that was progressing um, in science and technology. Um, and there were uh, medium and small sized businesses uh, blooming in Tigray before the war. But after uh, the new prime, prime minister came to power, there was an unorganized campaign against Tigrayans and hate speech going on in uh, various media. Uh, on social media, uh, dehumanizing to clients. So we we knew that this war was coming even uh, way before uh, the war actually started in uh, September uh, in November 2020. Um, after the war was declared, uh, we we knew that it was a, a systematic, well designed and well calculated war. It wasn't an accident like the Ethiopian government tries to portray it. It's not an accident. It was a well-planned and uh, well-designed uh, war. Uh, so after this war was declared uh, on Tigray, uh, the, the region was completely disconnected from the rest of the world. 
and we were unable to uh, connect with our family members. Uh, and the region has staged various um, grave human rights violations. Uh, and there was no information coming out and into uh, the region. So we had little information about uh, the region and it, would, it, didn't get, uh, it didn't get the uh, media coverage that it deserves. Uh, but after some time, we started um, getting some information, but uh, the, the government uh, has completely uh, locked the region and um, the Tigrayans were unable to uh, talk about uh, their story, uh, what is happening to them. So uh, we have been unable to know uh, uh, what is actually happening to our family members uh, in the past two years. So uh, in um, July 2021, there was a complete siege imposed on Tigray. So there was no humanitarian aid uh, getting through uh, to the region. Um, there was no medication, essential medical uh, supplies were restricted. Um, there was no banking and essential services were completely out of service. Uh, no telecommunication, no electricity, no water, uh, no fuel. So um, after some time we started hearing that people are dying from starvation. Uh, so uh, according to a recent uh, report, uh, it's estimated that nearly one million people have died from uh, this war, uh, mainly from starvation, obviously. Uh, and we have been expecting for the international community to intervene, uh, for the international organizations to intervene. Uh, but um, I hope we will discuss it later, obviously. Uh, but uh, there was very limited action from the international community. So we have lost so many people, so many innocent uh, people in this war. Um, yeah, that's something that I can add. Thank you so much, all three of you. I, I'm just sitting with the power with which you have described um, context in Tigray, uh, what's been happening over the last two years, and just sitting with the profound pain of saying, we don't know what's in Tigray to our friends, to our family, because of a process of genocidal war, which has shut down access to everything, to food, to medicine, to electricity, to the phone, to the internet, and particularly to recognize that starvation as a means of genocidal war is such a colonizing tool. Is We have seen this over so many areas of our own people, and for it again to be a tool in our own um, countries and contexts is terrifying. And therefore, to come really to the question around this moment and why we're having a conversation at this moment, we are actually speaking immediately after at the, at the Internet Governance Forum at IGF in Ethiopia, in Addis, which spoke about Internet trends and didn't mention Tigray by name. What does it mean for all three of you to be looking at this forum taking place in Tigray, right? Taking place in Ethiopia right now, given text in Tigray. What does it mean for the IGF to have been held in Ethiopia? And perhaps I'm, I might start with Selam this time and go around again. Um, yeah, I would say for me, it is uh, an endorsement of the government's. Uh, action because the government has been weaponizing the internet uh, to deprive the people of their basic uh, human rights uh, and um, the the reports are all over the place the the un has all the information uh, all the reports uh, even from uh, the investigators that were uh, deployed by the un itself so it has the information 
uh, it knows uh, how many people have perished in this war and how many people have been victims of this war. Uh, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, women who have been victims of sexual and gender-based violence in this war. And in spite of this, uh, the, the UN decided to... Um, oh, sorry. Is it okay now? Sorry. Also? Yeah. Uh, also, the, uh, they, the Tigrayan diaspora and the Tigrayan advocates have been issuing multiple uh, letters, uh, open letters, and um, writing articles on this matter. Uh, how the, the, Tigrayans ha the Tigrayans' voice has been uh, silenced because of the internet shutdown in the region. And we have been through a lot, not only the people in Tigray, because this war has been systematically targeting all Tigrayans in all over the world. Many people, including myself and my colleagues, have been dealing with mental health issues as a result of the shutdown because we have been connect disconnected from our close family members, friends, neighbors, and the community we grew up with. So uh, these things have been... Uh, told to the international community with all the possible means. Uh, and in spite of these repeated calls by uh, the Tigrayan advocates and the Tigrayan scholars, uh, they just decided to ignore the, the noise and just hold um, the forum in Ethiopia. So it is one way of uh, endorsing uh, what the Ethiopian government is doing and uh, endorsing the fact that governments can actually use uh, internet shutdown uh, and weaponize uh, the internet to um, to target people, to target uh, civilians. Uh, so it is it, it is um, disgraceful to see uh, such a well-reputed forum to be organized in Ethiopia. And we have also seen them celebrating while. Uh, six million people are still begging uh, for uh, humanitarian aid and humanitarian support. So we need more voices. Uh, we were expecting more action, like the, the Tigrayan community has been calling for action for more than two years since the war started. Uh, we have been calling for uh, intervention by the United Nations and other organizations and policymakers. But um disregarding this um they have just uh convened the forum in ethiopia and um it's it's a bad experience and also it's very frustrating because uh these uh big organizations and that we expect should be uh influential and that we expect would make uh, some change are actually uh, in, engaging in covering up such uh, heinous crimes by um, authoritarian governments. So yeah, that's uh, that's my initial um, understanding. And also, it is also covering up the government's uh, ill deeds because the the world uh, will get the impression that Ethiopia is such a democratic country uh, that is. Uh, that is allowing its uh, citizens to use internet because it's selected uh, to uh, to host the forum. So yeah, that's my the general impression that I have regarding the forum. Thank you, Salam. Uh, Mulu, would you like to add your thoughts? Um, maybe I can say a few things. Um, well. <laughs> I think first and foremost, um, one of the readings I have of this decision to hold this session, big session in, in Ethiopia during this particular time, is that um, Ethiopia has used the shutdown not only to cut, to mute people, to destroy a significant population in different ways, but also to uh magnify its own voice to win a narration of injustice 
this is a manifestation. It has won. Uh, in a bigger picture, it's very pessimistic, uh, the kind of conclusions that, that I and many of my friends make that at this age, committing such crimes as I would say genocide, even if that was to be debated, are the serious crimes, crimes against humanity, for instance, as per an international commission of inquiry, uh, which is basically another version of genocide by another name, if you see the legal history of the two crimes. To be able to present itself as if nothing is really happening tells me that genocide really wins. Uh, crimes really pays. Um, a very um, shattering experience. Uh, not only the experience that we have in relation to what's happening to the people, but also how laws in institutions, how the the world basically functions. It's it's um, an instance of how unjust the world is. I studied uh, human rights law. I was teaching international humanitarian law, the law that applies during war, and what this experience taught me that this is all uh, you know cosmetic the books we read the institutions we hear about uh, the studies we do really makes very little difference if any uh, and this has been uh, extremely painful basically because slowly you develop uh, a very different conception of what law is, what a person is. You lose many of your strongly held views, understandings of yourself and the world around you. That that has been the case for me. Um, I remember reading, I, I, I took a course some years back on internet governance and one of the things uh, that we we discussed in the in the early sessions of the course was how the internet was supposed to be an independent space where the sovereign states have no role to play. The declaration by Barlow from 1996 was very utopian, but one would not imagine that the internet would go to the extent that it becomes a very powerful tool for the powerful, for the state against people, uh, the way it happened in, in, in uh, Integrai this time around and in other parts of Ethiopia, by the way, wherever there is an operation, whenever there is a suppression of voices, the communication cut out, blackout accompanies it. So it has been a, a means of oppression in its fullest sense, uh, I would say, and this without, I don't know how they would justify if they have made it an agenda even if and why they should be awarding it here to host this. Um, so any accountability, not, not in the form of, you know, punishment, but accountability in the sense of explaining your decisions, basic tenet of, tenet of governance. I don't think they have gone through it in deciding to award this to, to Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, these are some of the thoughts I have when I heard uh, about, about the governance, for, internet governance from taking place in Ethiopia. Thank you. Something that we should all be mind. Um, yeah, I think um, Salam Mulu explained it very well. I think um, uh, if I mean <clears throat> for me, uh, the the fact that Ethiopia is hosting hosting the IGF twenty twenty two, I think like they explained it, it's there is a certain level of irony um, that Ethiopia, which is actually the, the Tigray internet communication blackout is actually the world's longest uninterrupted um, communication shutdown. 
um, and by any means to have a state who is actually imposing the world's longest uninterrupted shutdown of communication, hosting um, the, the, well, I think the thematic topic is on resilience. Um, um, and it's the irony factor in this that's almost laughable. Um, but aside from that, um, I think generally what this shows is the surface level of engagement that some of these states and some, some civil societies have with the Tigray, the, the Tigray conflict. Because it's not just about the hosting of um, this forum specifically, but it's the lack of engagement when they talk about the topic. For example, the PSVI uh, uh, conference in, uh, in London um, a couple of days ago, November the 28th, there was no Tigrayan representative. But we know right now that sexual gender based violence in Tigray is one of the most talked about and probably one of the biggest um, exhibitions of um, sexual gender based violence in a conflict. Um, and th there was not a grain representative, yet the, the UK government sent representatives to this forum to be a part of and to engage in um, the, this, the, this, um, the forum. Um, and it goes to show that some of the statements that we're hearing from such states and um, even Ant Antonio Guterres was, was a present. Um, and some of the condemnations that we're hearing is very basic and surface level. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, is there um, a will by not just governments, but institutions to engage in a manner that where they are ready to use diplomatic tools to actually influence states because i mean if they are talking about the the fact that the policies around um around communications and the internet in um certain states and the level of um state in, the level of state control over communications that, that is some of the to topics that will be discussed in these um in these forums so to be actually talking about those and not speaking about one of the prime examples of uh, oppressing communication to, to kind of um, to gaslight victims and to monopolize information in a way that benefits the states and completely exonerates human rights violations. Um, that is the irony. So it's, to be honest, for me personally, it's not the Ethiopian state that needs to be held accountable for hosting such an event when you know they haven't they're yet to clean their their own homes and to deal with such um you know to deal with um peaceful resolution to like conflicts and to actually allow um the deep depoliticization of things like humanitarian aid to actually take up some of their their constitutional promises to their civilians article 29 of the Ethiopian constitution itself um, what they're doing is they're breaching that by blockading um, the region of Tigray and creating an information blackout. So they're actually, you know, violating their own laws. Forget international laws, but even domestically, they're violating their own laws. And to be able not to have people to hold them to account and to have people to question such values and morals, I think that is where our worry and focus needs to be. Because how have we created a society that is unable to question such blatant violations of, um, of states' um, states' responsibility to protect their own civilians and to actually abide by their own rules? Um, and, and also, we have to really b begin questioning um, the level of engagement this shows from the international community, from international bodies, international institutions, not just state, not just governments, about the surface level of engagement that they have with these states that are, you know, convicted of um, the, violating uh, basic human rights laws, and like Moon said, war crime, they've committed war crimes and crimes against humanity, and like he said, legally, um, the historical context of such crimes, eventually some of them, if studied right and investigated, can lead to things like, you know, genocide. Um, so to be complicit um, in this, I think that is where we need to really start questioning the institutions that we've created globally and, um, and see whether they, they actually do value um, human rights issues and human rights um, 
uh, human rights uh, conflicts that actually violate um, po the populations or civilians, innocent people's um, basic rights to life um, and basic right to freedom of speech and communication as well. And I think I think <laughs> I think that's what I would like to add because they covered it a lot. Thank you to all three of you. Um, in so much of the context, both the national level um, of transgression and the international uh, level as well. Um, as you said, what are the use, what is the use of these laws and instruments if uh, there is holding to account of any of them? Um, and the uh, is such an example of, as you said, irony and complicity uh, from the international. Um, Mariana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Suya. And uh, I think that you already entered it in the in, in the final question we have talking about that not only the Ethiopian state must be accountable, but also uh, the international state system, uh, international uh, organizations, civil society organizations, other um, uh, forum and spaces in which um, internet violence, human rights uh, must be addressed without ignoring what is happening actually in Tigray. Uh, so maybe if you want, you you can uh, go deeper on that. But especially, we we want to hear from you about what's the civil, what should be, what must be the civic society response. What do you expect in terms of uh, what's your call to action? What's your invitation uh, for uh, organizations and collectives uh, to rise in solidarity uh, with this uh, with with this cause? And if you want to add uh, any other reflection or questions or or comment or comment between uh, each other that's also okay so let's uh, start this time with uh, mulu um thank you i i think uh, we have gone through some of some of the the basics um well uh, <clears throat> I think let me begin with civil societies over the course of the, the last two years. The Tigray war has been suppressed. Uh, it's, it's mainly it has it has mainly been about us uh, people from Tigray who have have been drawn drawn in in. A, in was what's happening in, in other major events and a very hostile and active um, narratives coming from the regime, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. So our voice has not been heard. So to an extent, you would understand why many have not been actively uh, helping. Um, but still, with, with the information available from news, um you would not i would not say that we have i mean the, the the conflict the victims have received the kind of attention that they deserve and what was possible even with all the the blackouts specifically on internet communications communication blackouts for instance in ethiopia almost none i would say of the civil societies have been voicing uh, that's that's a tragedy. Uh, much of the Ethiopian institutions have been in support of the regime. That was very very sad to hear. Um, but there has been some institutions, including, for instance, Access Now, that has from time to time been um, bringing this to to the attention of many others. So they they deserve credit. Um, and we, 
we demand, we call on others to push uh, for Tigray and other people, oppressed people, to have um, a dignified life. Uh, and that those who have actual power do not, should not be allowed to carry on uh, whatever they do with impunity. We have agency, everyone has something to contribute to help uh, other human beings. Uh, and therefore, yes, we need to be pushing to activate the civil societies everywhere uh, to, to advocate, because the plight of the people, millions, particularly in Tigray, is to continue for many, many years to come because life has been stopped, uh, it has been shattered. Uh, well, I don't know where to begin, but the economy is gone. Uh, people have not been paid and for two years now. I don't know how people are surviving and how many, if they are. So we need a, a, lot, of, a lot of support uh, in many ways. But also the state, I mean, it, it needs to understand that it, it would only be a matter of time. But a violation of this magnitude will never bring peace. So there is a need to address violations. Otherwise, they would come back in a year, 10, 20 years down the line. And therefore, uh, no matter how, um, how gross the violations have been, we still call upon Ethiopia, the state, Ethiopians, uh, to try to address, to stop to begin with and address past violations. I think um, that that would do for now from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Mulu and Melat. Can, can you continue with this topic? Yeah, I think um, Mulu, uh, you know, uh, established quite a lot of vital points about the um, the need for civil societies to engage with what's going on in Tigray because um, realistically. Um, the Tigrayan diaspora has been protesting, we've been writing letters, we've been doing a lot to make sure that the, what's going on in Tigray is visible to policymakers. Um, and I think, I mean, there are a lot of Tigrayan civil, civil societies and organisations that have been formed as a result of this, but civil societies have the capabilities to push for change in, in, um, in governments, a change in the, the stance that policymakers take when it comes to human rights violations. Um, and I think civil societies um, sometimes tend to be a bit um, reserved when it comes to tackling um, when it comes to ta tackling complex kind of um, conflicts like Tigray because there is a lot of background political context to it, I think that began, um, but like I said, like I mentioned when we first started, there, the, the, the country in itself has a complex history. But I think it's very important that we see things for what they are sometimes. And we see a humanitarian situation for what it is, which is a humanitarian situation. And we begin to depoliticize some of the needs of civilians and populations away from political, political um uh, political kind of conflicts or frictions because um, the population, uh, for example, when we're talking about the peace agreement, the peace agreement had a certain aspect to it that included transitional justice and humanitarian aid. And it's, it's I mean, under international law and it's customary law as well, that um, the need, the need for, um, you know, the right of an of a, of a innocent Tigrayan a, a random, you know, uh, a man or woman or a child living in Tigray to have access to basic um, humanitarian aid to survive, to have access to insulin to survive, to have access to medical facilities for survival should not be politicized. 
that should not be part of a political peace agreement. And I think it's up to civil societies to actually, when I talked about surface level engagements earlier, this is what I was talking about, because I mean, we, we can really say that, yes, we have said access to Tigray, but how do we get access to Tigray? We get access to Tigray by ensuring that there is a depoliticization of using starvation as a, I mean, um, there's a depoliticization of using food to control the population, of using food as a bargaining tool. There needs to be a separation between the needs of the people, the needs for them to survive, which is a basic human right, and a political, a political question, which is completely out of context from, um, from the survival of any average civilian living in Tibet. And I think that the, the civil societies need to be the one to push policymakers to see this, because policymakers, I mean, historically, we've seen it so many times in other conflicts as well. They're very late when it comes to human rights violations. We've seen Somalia um, starving in 2011, and there it was very late until um, famine had, was declared. There was no intervention. Uh, we saw the same things in Rwanda until over one million people died. There was no intervention. In fact, there was a lack of intervention in the sense that there was a there was a push to pull out the troops from there because of safety issues. Even though one million people were being, you know, were being killed actively. So, oh, when do we actually begin to understand that some of these laws that are written in the Geneva Conventions that are customary humanitarian um, law? these actually have to be implemented on the ground and the way we push for their implementation is when we as organizations organizations globally tr try to pick at some of the written aspects of agreements of um, false promises coming from states and humanitarian agencies and um, sorry humanitarian um, human rights body sorry and um, to actually pick at some of the gaps in the agreements and in some of the initiation and implementation of some of the things that you know um, we have agreed to or, or the states have promised to implement so i think there needs to be a heavy push from all civil societies um, to engage their policy makers in whatever respective states they're in to have a more an in-depth engagement with such topics with depoliticizing um, the humanitarian aspect from from the political aspect um, and I think that's very important. And in order to be able to do that, we have to make sure we're having these conversations and getting more knowledge about legally and more, may maybe more uh, on technical terms about what some of the some of the um, some of the decisions being made, uh, between, even if it's on um, AU level, international level, domestic level. We have to be very aware and conscious about what is actually being passed off as an agreement or as a decision or as a conflict resolution because again like we go back to having superficial conflict resolutions which actually do not help and do not actually uh, amount to tangible peace um so i think that's what i would add in terms of the the um what we can get from civil societies which is to push and put pressure on policymakers for deeper and in-depth um, engagement with um, humanitarian situations like Tigray. And I think I'll pass it on to Sela. All right, thank you. I don't have uh, much to add on what you said. Um, uh, just to say, uh, the war in Tigray has been, uh, I think, the largest humanitarian crisis um, and uh, also, we have seen uh, grave human rights violations, uh, including the um, industrial scale uh, rape in, and gang rapes to, um, uh, that was committed uh, on a <clears throat> um, number of uh, children and uh, young people. So, uh, but in spite of that fact, we haven't heard much uh, and we haven't seen much engagement from the uh, organizations, the community, the community organizations, uh, the feminist organizations. I mean, we were expecting more from, especially from the feminist organizations, because when you hear 
uh, hundreds of thousands of women have been victims of um, sexual and gender based violence there's nothing more that could outrage you like uh, we expected more advocacy from them the least they could do was just lend their voices to uh, the victims uh, but that that wasn't happening unfortunately uh, we understand that there was uh, limited access to information uh, and there was limited access to the region even by uh, the independent international media uh, but still, with the uh, available uh, evidence that we had, with the available uh, information that we had, uh, much could have been done. Uh, they could have done uh, more, uh, and we could have saved more people, uh, not only by the uh, major uh, international organizations like the UN, but also uh, those small um, uh, community organizations or uh, independent scholars, uh, we were expecting more writings on uh, on this uh, matter, but we haven't we haven't got uh, enough. And uh, also, uh, this war has uh, affected multiple aspects of human rights. Uh, millions of children in Tigray have been out out of school for more than two years. This is outrageous. Um, we cannot talk about a sustainable future when. Uh, children are not going to school at, at the moment if we don't in, uh, intervene and if we don't uh, invest today we cannot expect productive use tomorrow right um, but we haven't seen uh, advocates on uh, children's rights advocating for uh, the children in Tigray and uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed uh, they have been victims of uh, the starvation, the systematic starvation, some of the things, they don't even need uh, evidence. All it needs is just common sense to understand what is happening in Tigray. Because if a region is, uh, if a region had no access for more than two years, it just means that they cannot eat, they cannot uh, access medication. And if they don't have these basic um, uh, supplies, it means they are dying, so it doesn't need much calculation to understand what is happening in Tigray. But it was ignorance and avoidance, um, even though the Tigrayan uh, community, especially the diaspora community, has been very active um, in exposing the war crimes uh, happening in Tigray. And also there are um, reports by international organizations such as the Human Rights Watch and um, uh, Amnesty International that show that uh, crimes amounting uh, to uh, war crimes uh, have been committed in Tigray. But while this information was available, uh, nobody has taken action or nobody has taken, uh, nobody has been courageous enough to come forward and uh, voice this, um, these concerns and stand up for uh, the children and the women of Tigray. Um, also, uh, there were uh, essential services blocked. There was no banking, there was no telecommunication, and uh, there were protests in uh, almost all parts of uh, the world. But uh, all these signs, all these signs have been uh, ignored, and um, the international community didn't um, intervene. Uh, on the right time. Um, yeah, that's what I can add. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, before we close, I just want to make sure, is there anything else that any of you would like to say that we may not have asked you or that you're sitting with right now? I'm just leaving this open as a space just one thing probably an emphasis in a way uh, in the light of uh, the the submit the summit on internet uh, i think for many people the situation in tigray might have come across as an as no access to internet uh, and then relate this with 
in accessibility of the services needed for communication, communication barriers. Uh, it is not. Uh, this communication cut is related to HALS. Everyone, I, myself, and everybody I know with families in Tigray has one or the other other sorts of health issues. It's, it has become existential. Not knowing about your family, not being able to know what they need, not being able to share their pain is much more than a communication barrier. Uh, it affects your health. It, it affects livelihood of people. Uh, uh, in many ways, it, it would be important, basically, to, to as a as a kind of summary to put this blackout in the context of the larger blockade of uh, millions of people for two years, cut off every single. <laughs> material input for life, uh, including commercial activities. Just wanted to highlight uh, for, for our listeners to, to put that in, in, in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mullah. The last of Islam. Yeah, uh, just to add, um, I think, th yeah, I think when we look at the loss of communication, I think we have to look at it on a on a bigger scale than just simply us wanting to talk to our families as well. You have to look at it in the context of what has actually occurred in Tigray for the last two years. Um, the last two years, I mean, we have been gaslighted, we have been silenced. We there's nothing that we haven't gone to see the, to see the length of when it comes to disinformation, misinformation, um, and accusations of misinformation. And what we have been saying right from the beginning was, OK, we will not say things that are not factual, but simply let the people have a voice. If, if journalists want to actually get accurate information, they have to push for Internet um, access and for communication access for the people to be able to directly speak to people that these atrocities are happening to. They do not need a middleman such as the diaspora, their family members in Tigray, uh, outside of Tigray to speak for them. They should be able to speak and voice their pain and whatever has been inflicted upon them themselves. And that information is accurate. And that information is valid. And that is giving them a voice. And that is what the Ethiopian government has fundamentally tried to do. They've tried to silence these victims, not because there is a fear of simple propaganda or very low level kind of maliciousness going on. But there is a very high level organized intent to ensure that the evidence and to ensure evidence being some of these testimonies are destroyed. And that and people have been subdued in a way where after two years of suffering, they no longer have the interest to be able to, you know, speak out about what's what's you know what they've been faced with. And there is that push, there is the intent there to be able to ensure that this evidence is destroyed because communication means evidence can never be destroyed because evidence can be passed on from person to person, not just to family members, but to human rights organizations, to um, journalists and to people, even access to the Human Rights um, Commission, the UN Human Rights Commission of Experts. They have not been allowed to have access um, they have not been allowed to have phone calls to people in Tigray. They have had to conduct investigations relying on information with people like us to be able to be the middleman and convey um, some of the things that are happening through these voice messages, with very elusive voice messages and pictures that we're receiving every month or two, not steady communications. So what that the, inter the internet, the lack of internet and the lack of communication is actually a bigger issue about the the efforts coming from the state to silence and gaslight victims and to destroy like um, evidence that that will be required, that is required to ensure that justice is received for the victims. Um, so I think um, I think that's just what I wanted to add. And thank you so much for having us. 
Thank you. Milad Salam. Um, yeah, um, I, I wish the uh, organizations and um, associations could use uh, the, the story of Tigray for research and um, yeah, any um, outcomes. I mean, I wish this could be published. I wish uh, they could uh, manage. Uh, they could uh, find a way to speak to people who have experienced uh, these uh, atrocities, uh, because it will teach the world. Uh, it, it, the the war in Tigray will show how uh, internet and communication could be used uh, to effectively silence uh, more than six million people and uh, to hide war crimes like. We have seen in the past two years, we have seen people burned alive, people stoned to death, uh, a child stoned to death. Uh, we have seen gruesome videos, like every day we wake up to gruesome videos and we wonder if we are going to see our family members' faces next day, uh, which was very um, stressful and um, I, horrific like for any experience for any human to experience so uh, i wish more could be done uh, i wish uh, this government could be called out for what is what it's doing and uh, not only from uh, those organizations those big organizations but every organization every small sized or medium sized organization should um, take action, uh, should advocate for the people. Uh, in the past two years, Tigray has been literally destroyed because um, the public and private sectors, uh, private institutions, public institutions have been systematically destroyed by the Ethiopian uh, forces and uh, the allied Eritrea and uh, Amhara forces. And it has been looted. So Tigray needs financial support. Tigray needs psych psychological support and uh, m many forms of support. So we, we expect uh, support from the international community in various forms. Uh, so we, we expect more engagement even from your organization uh, in speaking up uh, against what has happened in Tigray and in supporting the women uh, because they have been traumatized, so much work is um, expected uh, in future. So I hope um, you, you will engage us too. We will be um, more than happy to work with you. And uh, yeah, our our community is very responsive to calls. So uh, yeah, I expect that thing. Thank you to also, um, and thank you particularly to holding us accountable as well, going beyond this conversation. And we very much want to work in support uh, and in solidarity, because I think you've you've particularly, three of you have so powerfully and painfully reminded us that this is not just about an internet. This is about the shutdown of the lives of over 7 million people and the diaspora, the family the friends, the communities associated with those people. This is about every form of life being shut down um, at all levels. And you've also reminded us that this is not about a political us and them. This is at the end of the day about being on the side of human life being, um, being held with dignity and respect um, or are we on the side of a child war that destroys um, through starvation, through rape, through multiple forms of torture, um, through the existential crisis that all of you are living in? So thank you for reminding us that it is that the internet shutdown is just a symptom of a much larger inking crisis and genocide in Tigray aspects across other parts of Ethiopia as well. I think I'm most sitting, as someone from India, I'm most sitting with the accountability you asked of the international civil society, because I sit with a similar sense of knowing that unless we all 
are in solidarity together. And we recognize that no one is free until we are all free, until, until we recognize that all are struggling to link. We cannot truly create just and equitable futures, whether digitally or person. Um, and so there's something very powerful about your asking us to be accountable to each other. And for us, I'm also asking in this, through this conversation, I think I'm asking our friends in society to step up and ask them to do and to see what it means for us to be in solidarity with you um, as we go forward. But most of all, thank you for the courage uh, in coming here for this conversation. Thank you for trusting us with this conversation. And we hold you with so much care and um, hope, even though they're at this point, um, I know you come with little hope. Um, we hope you would, we hold you with the discipline of hope that um, there can be solidarity and there can be peace with justice. Thank you again for being part of this conversation with us. And Thank you.